I'm Chris from Redmen TV. Do us a favour, do yourself a favour and subscribe to the Liverpool Connection podcast. Do it, do it now. Welcome to another episode of the Liverpool Connection podcast. I'm Dazza. I'm on me, Todd, today. Um, I've got a um, a great guest today. He's been on the show before. Uh, he had a book out called Little at 100. He's got a brand new book out called Crossing the Park, The Men Who Dare to Play for both Liverpool and Everton. So we'll get into that in a little bit, but um, pleased to see you again. Uh, it's Peter Kenny Jones. Hello, yes. Thanks. Nice to see you again, Daz. <laughs> There's been a few times we spoke to each other, I think, but yeah, second time on here. And yeah, okay. this was my first ever podcast, I think, last time. So it's nice to be back. So thank you very much. Ah, oh, you're welcome. And um and I know you've got quite a few things in the works. Um hopefully you can you can talk about that uh, a little bit later on as well. Let's uh let's do some therapy <laughs> for, for five five, ten minutes. Um Liverpool, God bless them. Um, it, it's a tough watch at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, we were just speaking about them, but yeah, it's, it's, it is a bit of hard work. We, I think we all know the qualities there, and we've got the best manager in the world, which then probably makes it even worse as to what's going on in it, because I think we've, we blame injuries, you can blame you know, lack of confidence, form and all that, but I think the, coming off the most recent game, that you know, we've, we've watched the City one, obviously, and that, that drop in, in effort was the scariest bit after the, the second, third, after the third goal, really, wasn't it, when the game was over and they stopped trying. And, you know, I think if they'd have done what we did against United, it could easily have been seven for them and we just heads had gone. And just, you never expect that from the Egan Clock team. You'd think that, you know, we can get beat by far. We saw that in our first season when we lost the games like Bournemouth and that away. And we saw that we can concede a lot of goals, but we always fall for everything that just, Seems like that fight's going, which is is the scariest bit. I think. Yeah, I I, I agree with you because like <sighs> that first half, and I don't really. <laughs> it's like you don't want to relive because you know I've already talked about the the city game, but I just don't understand going in at one one, and it was a very good first half, I thought, and then. You know, uh, me and my mates, we all said it. Keep your heads for the first 10, 15 minutes. And within 45 seconds, City score. But my my issue is more on like what Klopp said as well. Where's the challenges? But And it's not just been City. It's been many, many other games. Like Rodri, you know, we, we can all moan and shout and say he should have been sent off. But he did a tactical foul, which Fabinho should have been doing, which Hendo should have been doing, which any player should have been doing. We just let them walk basically straight into that goal. Yeah, it was painful, as you say. It was like, was, you're still settling down for the start of the second half. And obviously, I, I wasn't there myself, I was watching it though. And like, you looked up and it looked like defending for the 94th minute when we were going for a win, didn't it? it just, and then you watch it back, and De Bruyne just walks past Henderson, past Kanate, past Van Dijk. And, he just waltzes into the box and like he could have had as much time as he wanted to do whatever he wanted, but he unfortunately put it in the back of the net. But yeah, I think Klopp has said, doesn't he? It's, there's a lot said about the high line, about the defence being exposed and all that, but he's saying, well, whether it's the strikers as well as the midfield or whatever, but it's just that when you're getting so much time in the middle to just chip the ball over the back when our defence is so high up, they are going to get more chances and we are going to be exposed. And so that's what's happening. And, you know, it's hard to know what to do to fix it. Obviously, if everyone's saying we need to buy new midfielders, but we've still got games left this season. I know there's probably <laughs> hopes are probably diminishing very quickly of what we can get from the season, but I don't know what you can do to fix it in the short term. Like Bajet, it should be a good option. He's not there. Thiago would be good, but he's injured. Cater in theory could, could do that, but he's never there either. And James Milner, you could. He was probably the best one at doing it, but you can't play him for 19 minutes because he's 37 years old and he came on and set the tempo for us. But I think Hendo should be in a similar point where he's coming on. And then Fabinho's not been in full form. So like, what does he do for the last 10 games of the season to stop that happening? And he doesn't know the answer. So I tell you, I definitely don't either. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the first time really that I've, I've noticed uh, Klopp kind of calling his players out, not by names, but just saying there was only a couple of players on that pitch that, you know, 
gave as much as they should. Um, I think he's just getting pissed off. Because, uh, I mean, we, we, they had, what, 17 days of training. Not, not all of them, obviously, you know, because, like, Robbo looked goosed. Um, he played two big, you know, games for Scotland. But, I mean, the rest of them, 17 days to sort out a game plan. And it just seems as soon as it doesn't go well, the heads go down. I mean, this, this mentality monster uh, has gone, completely gone. No, it was that when we brought the subs on when I said uh, for me, you know, Oxley Chamberlain, I can't remember who else it was, maybe Simicas, and um, they came on. It felt like within two seconds they had gone from jogging to walking as well, and their heads were down. It's like, you, surely you've been sat on the bench watching that, you know, if any of us were given a chance, you go on and, and again, I, I don't want to say it again, but like James Milner, he came on and did it, didn't he? He came on and he was pressing people. And I think Trent did one moment where he pressed Edison, ran up, and then turned around and no one backed him up. But instead of like, yep keep going and saying, like, come on, everyone, follow me. He just stands there, puts his arms up, and obviously you congratulate him for the first part of it. The second part of it, that's probably as contagious, isn't it? And you you saw what, like, what the likes of Ronaldo did at United. If you stand there and throw your arms up, it makes everyone else around you not want to do anything. So it's just, yeah, as we said before, it's just worrying that they're not running. And, like, you'd say, if there was another team, you'd say they're not playing for the manager, which I can't see how they were doing that. And if Klopp had left, we'd sacked him and someone showed you that match, you'd say, oh, well, you'd never see that from a Jürgen Klopp team. But we are seeing all these things and I'm not in any way questioning him being in charge of the club. But it's just such a strange thing to say and we're just not used to it, are we? Which I think makes it even more worrying. Yeah, I mean, you know, Klopp's not above being criticised. You know, uh, everybody likes to have a go at FSG, um, you know, not for not spending. Bit. Klopp's the one that said he didn't need any midfielders. He was the one at the beginning of the season that said it, you know, and then went back on it and said he was sorry. And, and you know, and then we get Arta Mello, um, which obviously wasn't what he wanted. But, uh, you know, Klopp is, I'd like to say he is part of the problem because it's from top to bottom. At the moment, the club just just seems in disarray. Um, you know, we've we've had, uh, you know, Michael Edwards left, but he he said he had a ten year plan. It wasn't because Klopp or anything like that. He he was just ready. Ten years, he's done, gone. You know, uh, Ward is a weird one. You know, he gets appointed, and then halfway through the season, it's like. That's it. I'm done at the end of the season, you know. So that's and the an- analytic fella, he's going as well. So, you know, you got a question: Is it Klopp wanting more say in the transfers and the, and you know what's really going like back in the back side of things? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's the answer to that one, but yeah. I think we all we all love Jürgen Klopp, and I guess I wouldn't mind him if he wanted to say what transfers come in. I trust him more than I trust a transfer nerd who sits in his back cupboard watching everything. I'm sure they can help him, but I'd much rather he had the final say. But you know, as you say, then that transfer nerd was Michael Edwards who, who did some unbelievable things for us, didn't he? So it's hard to. I think you know you pointed Arthur Mello and you say that that would. Klopp didn't want him, whatever, but there's no way that you'd ever sign someone who you expected would only play 13 minutes, you know, up to the start of April. You know, no one could have foreseen that. Otherwise, you'd think you'd never have done that deal. And then we've got, like, as you mentioned before, and Abby Keita, you know, we sh- maybe we should have done home before, but he's on his last year of his contract. We're not going to get any money for him. Same as Oxley Chamberlain. I think there was just a conservative effort, effort to renew Milner's contract for the year and let Oxley Chamberlain and Keita run down the year. Don't have to sign another player. Obviously, then he panics and says, well, we do need to get someone and we get Arthur Mello in. But you think if you had an on like Carvalho, where we did sign and Gakpo, where we've now seen can play like in a Firmino position, still got Bobby Firmino. You've got Curtis Jones, you've got Harvey Elliott, Firmino, Henderson. You know, there's a lot of options there, isn't there? And, you know, people are saying push Trent forward and there's a lot of people we can still play in the midfield, but it's just, it's just not happening because of, freak instances, although a lot of them people might say, oh, we saw them coming because, again, it's not a surprise to, uh, at this point of the season, we're saying Naby Keita's out and so is Thiago. 
So, uh, yeah, it's just, I think they took a risk and it hasn't worked, I think. But it's not like we're going to get relegated and it hasn't worked. It's just we've had a, a, a season where we've took a step back and let's hope it's not too much of a step back that we can't recover ourselves for the next campaign. Yeah, and it, it, it's with, with Keita, you see that there's a good footballer there, you know, and it it's just makes you so mad that he's just made of Weetabix. You know, he, he goes away on international duty. He scores one and then an assist. And then <laughs> somehow from coming back, he's got an injury. And you're just like, you, you got to think to yourself, is, it, is, is he really like that injured or his clock just like, I'm just done. I'm just done with you. Yeah, well... You, would you blame him though? Because if you if you're him and he has he must have a bad injury record, you know. We can't say every single time he's been out he hasn't been injured. If you're him and you've got ten games left and you're trying to get a move in the summer, you, you don't want to be injured for when you're trying to get that, are you? Because mm-hmm. he's got a decent age to get a, a good move with you know, get high wages because of no transfer fee. So he's never really had a start and role in our team at any point. So you kind of think that that's the risk you take when you let someone wind a contract down that their heads are going to start to be turned, aren't they? And, yeah, Oxley Chamberlain maybe he's doing it the other way because he's I think he's come on in the last two games we've had as well. So maybe he's like pushing to get himself a move, and that's the probably the reaction you want. And you know, I don't think anyone's questioned Oxley Chamberlain's professionalism since he's been there. Maybe his ability some people have, but I think with Keith there, yeah, yeah, you come to this point where yeah, maybe he's just thinking even if I come and do a ten out of ten performance and push myself, he can probably well be benched for the next match anyway. So he's probably just yeah, half an eye on what contract he can get in the summer. Yeah, it's it's got to be a massive summer for us, doesn't it? I mean, Milner. I'm hoping Milner. Like again, I I think people aren't understanding what Milner brings to this team. But it's not just Cloppers. I' pretty sure he's thinking I can get him in the coaching role as well. So that's where the the year addition comes from and then people are just like oh, ah, you know giving giving Milner another year like they're not understanding what what Klopp wants to do with Milner they're just like you know he's going to take away some another player's minutes and stuff like that but you need you need players like him in in the squad because the youngsters look up you know uh, we we next season you can't be playing Stefan like like we have been this season there's, there's no chance, you know. Uh, he needs the cup games, you know, the League Cup, FA Cup, you know. God forbid Europa League or Europa Conference League, please no. Uh, I'd, rather, I'd rather be 10th, to be honest. Um, but pe- people don't understand what Milner brings. Um, I just think it's one of those, I, I think it's a younger generation that don't quite understand, you know, why Klopp wants to keep him. But yeah, it's got to be a massive summer because we're losing what four or five players at least. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Uh. You know, I I I do trust Paul Joyce, and I, you know, whatever the Twitter brigade come out with, you know, I I, I trust Paul Joyce over them. Lot. I mean, Liverpool are a hundred percent in for Bellingham. There is no buts or ifs. Uh, and it just all depends, you know, if he believes in what Klopp, you know, Klopp's plans for the next couple of years. I don't think Bellingham's all about money. He, he, he seems like he's got, he's all about the football and the project. And, you know, I, the only other team, I just can't see him at City. Yeah, well, if I, he's, he's, if we don't live Paul fan, you start to think, if I was him, you surely you'd go to City because you'll get loads more money and probably win more trophies. But then, as you say, hope for, we're hoping on the romantic side of being a Liverpool fan that you're selling those European nights, which might not be there next year. Yeah. Yeah, the cop, but yeah, they the will cop. be there. They'll be a couple back of years back. exactly. And, he, and he's 19 years old. You know, it's not like he's 27 and this is a, his last big move that he's got to make. He's got time to come to Liverpool and be a brilliant player in a failing team for three years and make another unbelievable move and still be not even be 25 yet. Do you know what I mean? So he he's perfectly within his, his rights to say, right, I want to make a footballing decision. And, you know, he, he went from Birmingham to Borussia Dortmund, which 
obviously is a normal transfer, but it's not something you do if you're looking for money, you know, obviously that's somewhere that, again, you grow and you're, you're looking to go and play your football. So, you know, you hope, because his parents have such a big say in what he does, apparently, and you read all this stuff. But, yeah, as I say, I think we're definitely in for him. I think we've definitely got a chance, but, you know, I don't think he knows where he's going in the summer yet, never mind anyone else. So, you know, what he's going to give everything for Bruce Dortmund, because we're saying the chance we've got of signing him is because he loves football so much and he's not going to let his head be turned until the final whistle of the last game of the season. You know, they're in a title race. To, that's the best way to be sending a send, a send off to the fans there is to go win the league, isn't it? So I think then it's a long summer of negotiations. But as you say, we've got, it's not just one we need to sign and that's not saying the midfield's awful, which, you know, yes or no, whatever, because we've got so many people leaving. We do have to go and sign four or five players and they're not all going to come on a free. So it is going to be a big summer regardless if we sign Jude Bellingham, but he's probably going to be someone who is signed and the final few weeks of the transfer window, isn't he? And we'll be talking about them still in, what, six months' time, saying, will he come, will he come? And then we'll finally find out on deadline day, probably. But but yeah, it's just, it's going to be an interesting one. It's probably going to be exciting because we all remember that uh, Suarez, Andy Carroll, January transfer window, and that was, that was fun because so much was going on and Torres left and everything. So it's going to be worth watching maybe, but... Yeah, it's a and it's touched on James Milner as well. Yeah, definitely I'd keep keep hold of him, no doubt as well. Yeah. Well, now that we've done our little therapy session, <laughs> let's let's talk about this this new new book. Um where where did you get the idea from? Uh yeah, so me uh, my girlfriends are blue and a lot of me uh, my family's split as a lot of a lot of families are in the city. So I was just trying to find a way that we could yeah, everyone's interested in football together and not in like a selfish money grabbing way, but just in a way that was working. I was just looking at some of the players who were playing for both teams. I thought that was that was interesting enough. There was a lot of names I hadn't heard of, or a lot I had heard of. And yeah, just the more I researched it, the more I realised it was those you hadn't heard of that were probably as interesting as the ones that would probably bring people into reading the book about it. And then, yeah, thankfully the, the publishers agreed and, and here we are. When... When was the first first uh, player to do it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Liverpool's first ever game. There was three players who had played for Everton before, so they were probably the only people who were in the book who never actually crossed the park because they just stayed exactly where they were. But they, yeah, so they obviously just stayed with John Holden and there was a big split and it was a decision on who wanted to stay with him and not many did. Obviously, he had that famous team of Max and it was the, the Scottish lad who stayed and probably that was part of the way of convincing them was saying we're going to have a big Scottish contingent and yet so there was, it was Everton's captain as well at the time who stayed and Michael Liverpool's captain and that's Andrew Hanna and yet the other two, Tom Wiley and Duncan McLean were the, were the, the first three to ever officially make the, the move over yeah, it's, it, it's crazy because I, I, I was looking at the names and some of these players, I, I didn't even remember, you know, playing for both teams. Beardsley was one. Yeah. I see that he played for, for both teams. But, I mean, for, for everyone out there, I mean, the, the most recent you've got, obviously, Benitez. Um, which wasn't very good for Everton. <laughs> but, uh, David Hutchinson, Nick Barnby, Cody Connor. Um, Vesterveld also, I did not know, played for, for both. Uh, Xavier, Peter Bardsley, Peter Beardsley, McMahon, Gary Ablett, Davy Johnson, and Kevin Sheedy. That's mental. Yeah. So, well, I think, as, as you say, there's so many, that's not me having a dig here, but there's some a little bit before my time who maybe I wasn't as knowledgeable about them. Maybe there's some of the more recent ones. But even like, yeah, Sander Vesterveld before Connor Cody. And Rafa, obviously, but player wise, um, he was the last one to, to cross the park. But it was an emergency loan from Portsmouth to Everton, so it's one of them in the council. I only played twice, but you know, it's, it's still a quite a big story. That obviously, he's the one who won the treble with Liverpool, and yeah, and then the one before in at Abel Xavier, he's just like, I don't think that many people cared that much because Everton needed the money and Liverpool needed cover because Marcus Babel had just got ill. and then before that, it's Nick Barnby, <laughs> front, line, front page headlines because of, of what him saying he wanted to leave, scoring the derby and all that. So, but just by looking at them, you think, you know, obviously, 
the rivalry's got so bad, it must no one could do it nowadays. But the last two before Conor Cody, and I don't think Conor Cody got too much of a bad blood about it. It's, but that's what made it interesting for me is that every single transfer is different, and it all depends on the time they happened, how they happened, from which way they went, made the transfer, and all stuff like that. So, yeah. And I, Obviously, we touched on then it started in 1892 and it's still going on today that there's people who play for both sides and you know there's periods where they do a lot of transfer periods where they don't do hardly any but yeah just I think that really helped tell the story of obviously Liverpool FC because Everton was there before it but it helped tell the story of the Merseyside football rivalry from day one up to today and just by looking at these 34 men. Well, I know. Uh... Xavi uh, only uh, is the only player to have featured for both teams in a Merseyside derby during the season as well. Yeah, yeah. So I saw that as well. Yeah, so he's. Um, <laughs> I think I, I think I wrote in the book because he would never scored for Everton, and then on his debut he scores for Liverpool. <laughs> um, um, Nick Barnby, sorry, um, Nick, sorry, yeah, Abel Xavi had never scored before for Everton. Goes and scores for Liverpool on his debut, and then. He'd have been forgiven as an Everton fan to think what happened the year before with Nick Barnby scoring in his first derby after the move. Yeah, but they were all thinking, oh, well, putting the house on Abel Xavier scoring because of the way it was going for them. But yes, he never managed to quite score in it. But yeah, as you say, that's obviously maybe more of a look into how transfers are a bit different nowadays in the January transfer window. But yeah, obviously, it's it's another interesting stat to say you can do that in the same season. I don't think that's going to be repeated anytime soon either. How how many players actually went straight from Liverpool to Everton? Was that uh, yes. Conor Cody? Obviously went to to Wolves. Fired um, others, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I, I don't want to take exact numbers on me, but I think it's the it's the majority. I think it was about eighteen, something like that. So it's quite quite a lot of um, quite a lot of them did. And obviously, it's again that's looking at how the rivalry changed because back in the day, that like, when I was reading through like the club minutes because like, the Everton Heritage site have got the minutes of every meeting that Everton had up to like the 1980s and all that so they were accepting lower offers from Liverpool because they were friendly with them so saying oh no we'll get 50 grand less and which is like about 50 million less today as of how the transfer fees had changed but they were getting quite a bit less money but they were happy to help out the neighbours and then that's in my opinion that's probably how I think the rivalry should be carried on into the future obviously i know there's a lot of a lot of people who might think otherwise but just by looking through this you just notice how the feeling between the clubs today is really a very new feeling for how long this rivalry has been going on for and everyone's so wrapped up in it now but if you go back two generations maybe even less than that there's there's a lot of people who disagree with it and think you know no, the city's better coming together and obviously there's a lot of reasons for why it happens and that's all stuff i tried to touch on in the book as well but yeah i think I like the idea that both clubs can help each other out and you know, maybe we haven't got too much facility to help anyone else out at the moment. But if we had a few loan players, maybe you go, I'll oh, be trying to help Everton stay in the league and they did that. And then face face, if they were trying to help us win a league, I don't think that'll ever happen. But I think that's probably what would have happened back in the day. Well, it must be great, you know, for, for just researching stuff, like you know, like you do. Um, because end of the day, you know, I would never have known half the stuff, three quarters of the stuff that's in the book. So researching, you, you, you know, yourself, you just got to be going, ah, oh, oh, <laughs> I knew that, you know, and, and it yeah. comes across really well. Because I, I, I like how you, you actually did, did uh, the chapters of the book, you know, the 1800s, World War II, uh, that was really well well organized um and, and and i think that you know if you are a liverpool or everton supporter and the, these kind of books if you really want to know the history it is really good um you know yeah it's great when you, your old man can tell you some stories you know but usually after stories are made up you know so actually getting it this in one a, is as well don't worry <laughs> That's <laughs> getting it in a book, you know, um, to, to learn about the, the history because, you know, it, that's the thing. It, it, it's a tough one for me it, for, for like this season. It's like Everton, obviously, part of the city, but it's part of me where I want them to go down. 
And I know it's a horrible thing to say to, you know, about a team that's in your city and has done so much for the city. It's one of those, I'm like, yeah, just go down for a season. But I think if Everton do go down, they might not be coming back up for a while. Yeah, well, it's, it's one of them. It's just, um, <laughs> I can't say too much as I'm trying to write a book about sides. But, yeah, you, <laughs> you know, obviously, as a, as a Liverpool fan, you grow up and what you learn from just going to matches, you don't like Everton, and that's fine. And that's how it should be on the derby day. But just think about our city. You've got that new stadium there. And next season, they're, they're in the championship. They're in, already in financial difficulties as it is. Now, if they go down to the championship, it's only going to get worse. And who's to say the stadium gets finished with whatever owner if he does a runner? You like you can't have that sitting there in the city, and it's it's a lot of money that they pulled out of it and going out to Europe and like the European Union and all that type of stuff for for the city's already not done very well. So it's going to be it will be a bad thing for for everyone if they go down. But at the same time, you watch them and when you when you're trying to beat them five 0 on field and you're laughing at them. And vice versa for them. I'm sure they they feel the same. It's just it's a um, it's just a sad side of how it's changed. Like I, I wrote in the book when when they got relegated in, in the sixties. Well, sorry, before they got promoted in the sixties and fifties. And um, Billy Little writes a, a letter in, into the Echo and just basically says, "Best of luck to Everton for next season. Hope they win the league and hope we win the Division One and then we come back up and, and join them." And you're just like, you know, imagine that happening today. Imagine. If Evan go down and James Coleman goes to the Echo and says, oh, do you mind if I just write a letter wishing they've pulled good luck for next season? It, you know, he'd have his house petrol bomb, wouldn't he? So it's, it's, it's just, it, as I say, it changes. That's fine. They, they were friendly, they were friendly, whatever. But I just think by looking at it, maybe instead of giving my opinion on it, but, but just by reading through the book, you can see the, how the trends change. And you know, it goes back all the way to the 1920s where, where Arthur Betty was the first player I found who, showed like some hesitation about going between the clubs before then it was just you know it was a move and it was it was fine but he was his dad was on the Everton board and he was probably signing for Liverpool and he, was, he wasn't sure if it would reflect badly on his dad but his dad had also been part of Liverpool board before he went to Everton so his family were already a bit twisted anyway and then Arthur Betty goes on to be the first ever player and still the only player to have signed for Liverpool and Everton on two separate occasions so you know it, each individual story as I say, is different to these transfers different and hopefully that's what comes across in the book is that there's no rhyme or reason to why, when the rivalry started when it was good when it was bad which transfers are good it's all just very as it happens I think the, the, the Benitez one to me is the one that just blares out just because you know he, he'd done so much for Liverpool winning the Champions League and you know very tactical um, and he, you know, he, he still li- lives on Merseyside, so that that was kind of like a no-brainer. I mean, for him, uh, but I, I I know a lot of Evertonians took it pretty badly. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it would be weird, like if David Moyes, you know, would would be the manager of Liverpool as well. I'd be like, uh, what? No, no. Thank you know, and it, and it, it what just at, at that time when Benitez came in, well, they've been pretty bad from, from the top down. You know, uh, the ownership is obviously not good enough, the, the fans want them out. Um, you know, so the appointment of Benitez was a shock, uh, obviously to, to me and to Evertonian. So, uh, you know that's that's the big the big spotlighted one. You know for a lot of people, and uh, I, I didn't think he Rafa deserved all 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 that crap he got. You know he, he was there. He, he he's an honest manager, and he was there to help Everton. Yeah. You know. Yeah, well, I, I think he, he. Sorry, but I think he. I think to be fair to the Everton fans, you were when you start hearing the rumours, you go, "No, we can't come." And that's probably, as you said, then if, if if we had had some form of Everton managers link with our job, we'd probably say the same. No, we don't want him. But once he was there, he was on the, in the dugout and he was their manager. I do think they they weren't sick of his name, but they weren't like, they weren't booing him every time he came out. You know what I mean? They were behind the team, and then they started well. And then he obviously wasn't he was only there a few months, but after a couple of months, it started going quite badly. Run, didn't it? And 
he, you know, he didn't he didn't really have much time, much borrowed time, but maybe you should say to to live off. And he was always have some animosity as soon as anything went wrong, and maybe that made it a bad atmosphere. But I do think that you know when you when you look at his CV, he won the European Cup, obviously it's with us, but he, he had success and managed Real Madrid, Inter Milan, Chelsea. You know, he's not just like he was only us. He he'd been with, but I think once you look at the CV and and what they had on offer elsewhere, he probably was the best man for the job. And you know, maybe it's a, that's a sign of a great owner going out and getting him, but it didn't work. So it's always gonna you're gonna end up with egg on your face. And I think for him, it was just I just you say he didn't have to move home. He's he's still trying to get a job in the prem now, isn't he? he keeps saying, and he you know, he wants to stay local. So he can't get more local than the Everton unless he wants to take the Tramier job. I think that's the only one that's closer to his house. So, uh, but yeah, I think. For him, he, he was an interesting one and obviously one of the most hated for Everton. And I was, it's because I spoke to obviously quite a few fans from either side just trying to get like public opinion on on everyone. And uh, yeah, he he was an interesting one, but I do think they, they gave him the, the time of day initially. When's, um, you can pre order it right now, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So out on the 24th of April, but yeah, you can pre order it now. Obviously, it's on. All the major sites and all that, Amazon and whatnot, and obviously Waterstones and W H Smith and whatnot. Uh, but it's also on my website, and I've got like, you know, you can just buy the book there, or I can sign it for you. And I've, I've also got like solely Liverpool and solely Everton covers. So if you know, if you like the idea of it, but you don't want any Everton crest on your bookshelf, that's fine. I've, <laughs> I've catered for you. So you, there's all the, like pre-order bundles and stuff you can get on there as well. And, yeah, oh, yeah, if you can grab a copy, that'll be much appreciated. It's like when you're in school and you've got the <laughs> school book and then you, you've, got, you've got the actual outside of the book and then you're reading something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can do that. You can kid everyone. Yeah, that's fine. If you want a red cover instead of a blue, which I think is what the majority of people listening to this would, would want. <laughs> <laughs> um, apart from um, that, I know you've got some other stuff you've been working on. Um are you still doing the? Can you say it? Uh, Liverpool Oh yeah, well, <laughs> nothing's officially signed, so maybe you can you can that can be the um, well, is it the, the slow reveal there? It's, yeah, it's a former Liverpool goalkeeper's family. I am in discussions with yeah. for the next one. I think it probably is going to all go ahead. It's just um, it this one comes out at the end of the month and all that. So it's just about trying to get. So I can dedicate all my time to it properly. But yeah, hopefully that's the next one. And yeah, and obviously I do have a bit of other writing and stuff on the side as well. And it's all just um, it's all a bit go at the moment. It's always a busy month. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's a uh, lot of stuff going on. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, Pete, Peter also does um writing and does the podcast for uh, Empire of the Cop. Uh, I've been on there a few times, it's absolutely great. Farrell's brilliant. Yeah, uh, as the as the main man, um, and you still doing your quizzes? Yes, we have we haven't done one in a while. To be fair, we had like a few changes in the it was working there. Not like terrible, but just it's all been a bit up in the air. But I think we're hoping, and also it doesn't help when you're not doing very well. Just you not everyone's as excited to talk about it, is it? So I think maybe over the summer we can do a few quizzes, and there's less him, um, there's less upset about it. But yeah, I always try and get one together. So we went to um, went to Paris last year. I did like a big quiz for it on our like we had a mini bus there and back and I think I had like a, a five hundred question quiz and we ended up on the, in like the last services before we got home and there was one point between the two sides and the last question I couldn't have made, I couldn't have made it more perfect so it all came down to you had to guess who Jan Kronkamp's career I get them five facts and then one of them got it one didn't but yeah I do like doing a little quiz that's always a good one I'm saying maybe I can try and do that. Uh, going in the future as well. I know you, you're not always the biggest fan of getting quizzed. You've you've, um, you've had a go at me a couple of times on them, but <laughs> but yeah, that's what I like to do. And obviously, yeah, working for Empire of the Cop, that's like be me Monday to Friday, nine to five type thing. So yeah, so it's a lot, very busy, but yeah, lots of stuff going on. Yeah, I get the answers after the quiz. <laughs> I, I, my brain doesn't work so so quickly. Like you know, when I when I'm asked a question, like it just either goes blank or some other names come up that as soon as the quiz is over there it is it's like right like there so I'm like yeah that's no. why you asked them instead of answering them that's, a, that's what you got to do there he's, yeah, you, you, you've got, <laughs> he's got the right way of doing it yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like you know what you know all the questions and the answers okay, so, then, yeah. 
Yeah, you look <laughs> dead brainy. <laughs> well, yeah. Tisa, it's always a pleasure. Um, please, uh, if, you, if you're into books, <laughs> hopefully um, you can pick this one up. Um, probably, if, if you can go to Peter's website, and I'll uh, put that in the description and everything, but... Um, yeah. It's I'm I'm halfway through it at the moment, um, and I'm in, I'm I'm enjoying it because again, you know, I love the history of uh, of Liverpool, and you know, to to learn the history of Everton as well is, is always good. You know, uh, g- gives me some ammunition to uh, throw, <laughs> throw at them. <laughs> yeah, well, if I'm allowed to mention as well, so I've got a book launch as well. If that's I'm allowed to men- plug that because I've got a few awesome. tickets to sell for that, and that's um, obviously I know. This is the for the Texas fans, so maybe it's a bit of an effort, bro. If you anyone's over for the Tottenham game, it's that weekend, uh, it's the twenty eighth of April, so it's the Friday night, uh, Hotel Anfield. I've got Kevin Cheedy and Steve McMahon coming, and they're obviously going to be talking about playing for the other club, which I think is something maybe they don't do too often. And um, yeah, I've got like a musician on. I've got Farrell from Empire of Copies hosting it for me, and we're doing like a live Q and A that's going to come out as a podcast after and. Obviously, they're going to be signing books as well. She's in McMahon for me. So, yeah, we can come down. There's food, there's drink. Should be there all night. And hopefully, it'll be a good one. There's a few tickets to sell on that as well. That, that's on, over on schedule. But if you, if you just go on, like, if you put the link up, that'd be great. And um, Peter Kelly Jones on, on Twitter and Instagram and whatnot. All, all the links on my bios and everything there. But yeah, if you come to that, that'd be great as well. Yeah, please. You hear different Peter. If, if, if you're in Liverpool, get down there because um, I, I know Steve McMahon is an absolute brilliant storyteller. So uh, we've had him on before, and uh, you, you're just glued to, uh, especially that the the older players just have so many cracking stories that just you know I I, I love to listen to. Like you can't get enough of them. Yeah. Well, and as I say, hopefully it's stuff that people won't have heard before as well because I can't see. Steve at Mar getting too many Everton gigs and Kevin Cheaty getting too many Liverpool gigs. So hopefully it's a good excuse for them to tell stories that you don't really get to tell. And yeah, and if you can't come down, it's all in the book as well. So you're sorted. It's a win-win either way. <laughs> well, Peter, I appreciate you coming on, and um, won't be strangers. Um, yes. What once you've got uh, everything signed and sealed on the <laughs> on the goalkeeper. Uh, yeah. We'll get you back on and, and talk about that because uh, yeah. Charles and Tanji's family are really hard to get hold of. That's, that's what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, thanks very much. It's been nice. Thanks for having me again. As I said, it was, uh, was I remember I'm, I'm maybe a bit less nervous this time, but last time when my first book came out, this was my first ever one. And I remember it was like 40 degrees. I'm sweating and I was nervous <laughs> anyway. So I feel like it's, um, it's been good that we've come, come this far. And now obviously I can call you one of my um, be online friends and yeah looking forward to coming on again so thanks very much ah you're welcome and um again uh please subscribe and like put your notifications on um and we got some huge news uh i know peter's i think i've already told you about that um uh, but i haven't told uh our subscribers yet um but that'll come out on wednesday for the arsenal um preview show so uh got a few few big things in in the works and um yeah really proud and everything so uh yeah everyone thanks for listening and uh we'll see you later